Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Michael, Anthony. Um, I'd start by um, saying thanks to Anthony for his very kind invitation. Uh, once again, bringing me in conversation with Michael and of course to show my gratitude to Michael for the many inspiring conversations over the years. Um, I think we've known now each other for about six years. Um, and um, oh, thank you so much for alerting me to the, to the volume. I tend to be very soft spoken. So if there's any um, issues with sound, please do feel free to write on the chat. Um, and uh, finally, I want to thank everyone who's joining us this evening. Uh, so the way that um, Michael and I decided to structure this conversation is very fluid, very organic. I will uh, have a few questions from Michael through which uh, we'll start to unfold parts of the book for you. Um, we hope to cover as many topics as, uh, topics as possible in the 40 minutes that we have, and then we'll have a generous 20 minute um, time for Q&A with you. With you. Uh, so please do think about your questions, uh, thoughts, comments, and I'll be very happy to relay them to Michael. Um, so Michael, if I may, I'll start uh, with uh, an opening question um, and uh, with an opening indeed with the epigraph to the book, which is uh, from Revelation 119. Um, and I quote, write therefore that which you see and that which is and that which will become after this. Uh, I imagine these are trialing times for a phenomenologist uh, who's trying to make legible a kind of violence that occurs gradually, that is out of sight a lot of times, that is dispersed across time and space. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what is the genesis of the book and why now? Yes, thank you very much, Sophia, for, for this question. It's a pleasure to be in conversation with you. And thank, thanks to Anthony as well for organizing this event in which I'm very happy to participate. Uh, now, the, the quote that you uh, opened with and the, that the book opens with is an epigraph from Revelation 119. Uh, and it's a very kind of apocalyptic uh, uh, injunction. In fact, it's the injunction to describe the apocalypse. Uh, and uh, I precisely started thinking about dumb philosophy or the themes that became this book, Dumb Philosophy, based on the need to find a new language to articulate the times that we're living in. Because there is a sense in which uh, the traditional language of philosophy, and by that I mean not only Western philosophy, but also non-Western traditions, is failing us precisely because we are living through events that, uh, uh, that are quite singular and quite unique in the history, not only of humanity, but of the planet as well. So the idea is to try to catch up with the physical material events themselves at the level of discourse. Uh, and uh, as, as you know from the rest of the book, from, from reading the book, I try to do this even in relation to the so-called classical elements, such as water, fire, air, or earth. I claim that the elements have uh, by now received so much uh, anthropogenic pollution uh, that they have been transformed beyond recognition. In a sense, when we think about water, we think about a pristine, clear, and transparent substance, which is no longer the case, even though it might not be visible to a naked eye without a microscope, what is called water is full of microplastics, heavy metals, uh, other sorts of pollutants and so on. So my proposal is to call water a hydro dump and air an aero dump in order in our language at the level of discourse to try to approximate to uh, what is happening on uh, nowadays, both at the environmental level and also at, the, at all kinds of levels of interpersonal relations, political uh, realities, economic processes, and so on. So um, this was the felt need uh, at the origin of dumb philosophy to try to come up with a language for speaking about what seems to be unspeakable, uh, this, uh, this sort of sublime, uncanny, uh, and, and devastating transformation that we are living, living through. And dumb, to my mind, was an appropriate word for thinking about uh, the contemporary condition uh, at all kinds of levels. 
Uh, in fact, um, thinking about what um, Heidegger, uh, Martin Heidegger uh, used to say, which is that every epoch has its own word for being. My idea was that dump, both as a verb and as a noun, could become that word for being in our 21st century. That was at least the wager of the book. But at the effective level, I must add, there was a sense of uh, an overall depression, a kind of depressing mass of uh, sheer facts and felt, uh, um, uh, felt devastation. Uh, when, when you not only think about, but see all around you the uh, event of the sixth mass extinction, it cannot help but provoke these negative affective uh, uh, feelings, right? Like uh, uh, a depression which is no longer linkable to an event in one's personal life, but it is uh, really overarching. And that was probably an effective ground for dumb philosophy as well. I quite like this idea of speaking about the unspeakable um, and really the way that you articulate this in narrative form throughout the book is very special and, and perhaps a little different from the usual writing style in your other books, but I think we'll get onto that um, towards uh, later on in our conversation. Um, so I think one of the, sort of the very strong ideas that underlie um, this depression and this depressive mode um, and, and that depressive no, uh, mode by way of the Anthropocene or by name of the Anthropocene uh, is, and I quote, uh, shitting without giving a shit, uh, a kind of form of transcendental indifference um, that you markedly describe as nihilism. And, uh, and I want to sort of very quick, quickly recall uh, Jean-Luc Nancy's um, praise for your book, uh, which is uh, Michael Marder contributes a great treatise on nihilism. Uh, so why do you think Dump is a capacious enough narrative figure to speak about our current times? I am sorry. <laughs> yes. uh, ju just to begin with this uh, uh, more specific question of the Anthropocene, uh, I'm uh, not one of those people who tries to come up with an alternative term for the Anthropocene, like the Plantocene or uh, Capitalocene, and uh, there, there's now a whole range of those terms. Rather, I want to understand beyond uh, the term itself, I want to understand the dynamics of what has been conventionally by now called the Anthropocene, as the dynamics of creating uh, a dump out of the planet itself. Uh, so that the traces of industrial activity that are now embedded in geological strata and in the atmosphere, uh, to my mind, uh, relate to a kind of dumping of uh, not only industrial waste, but the dump, the excrements of the uh, human technobody. Uh, uh, a collective intergenerational technobody uh, that is uh, leaving its excremental waste uh, and marking the planet with its excremental uh, waste. So the way that I interpret specifically the Anthropocene is in relation to um, uh, what Freud has to say about the anal stage of development and about uh, the whole affective, once again, relation to the excrements by, uh, by the child who is uh, learning to control uh, its intestinal functions and, and, and so on, uh, and all kinds of mythologies and uh, ideation that develops around these physiological processes. Because once again, I think that we don't have only our physiological bodies, but uh, uh, we, we have a collective techno body, even if uh, um, we, we are not the owners of these means of production that are polluting everyone who is alive at the, at the moment is participating in, in this uh, collective uh, techno body of humanity. And even people who are long dead, that's why I'm saying that it's an intergenerational uh, techno body. Uh, and, and it is this, this body that is reshaping the elements that is leaving its waste uh, embedded in, in the atmosphere and on uh, the earth. Uh, and, and that was the origin of this expression of shitting without giving a shit. Uh, the, the idea that uh, dumping in its more vulgar sense, in the excremental sense, uh, involves large amounts of excrements that uh, somehow uh, one expels. 
uh, and and then um, uh, it it uh, also we have at least in English there is this expression of not giving a shit, not caring, not having any concern whatsoever uh, about something, uh, and the two really converge in the idea of this uh, um, uh, of, of this experimental Anthropocene. Uh, so yes, uh, I think Jean Luc Nancy was absolutely right that uh, th this indifference. Uh, that uh, I, I have touched upon in uh, converting the, the whole planet and the elements into dumps uh, is an expression, a very concrete expression of nihilism, of what already uh, Nietzsche diagnosed as Western nihilism. Uh, and um, as both Nietzsche and Heidegger uh, uh, tell us, it is uh, rather pointless to simply brush away or brush off nihilism or try to uh, um, separate oneself from it, to somehow protect oneself from it. Rather, the only hope for uh, getting through it is by way of deepening this nihilistic mood and then hopefully emerging on the other side in a process that uh, might be very protracted, might be very long. Uh, I think Nietzsche has uh, several hundreds of years, several centuries in mind. Now in the 21st century, we realize we might not have as much time uh, to go through the depths of Western nihilism that in fact uh, a livable planet might be uh, uh, um, completely endangered and no longer livable by the time that uh, this is worked out at the uh, ideational and effective levels. But um, at least in the book, I try to come up with a few concrete strategies for uh, both deepening and emerging out of this uh, uh, nihilistic attitude uh, to the world, to others, and to ourselves as well. And of course, an important um, sort of caveat that we tend to do when, when we're talking from ecological discourse on the visual arts and so on, uh, is very much a, a, a clear consciousness about uh, the we, the we that we're speaking from. And um, and it, it's also clear, and you make this uh, abundantly clear in the book, that uh, it's not possible to avoid our, compl our complicity on an individual, on a social, mental, economic, political levels. Uh, to social relations of environmental harm, uh, past and present, this sort of intergenerational, excremental um, uh, mechanism that you were describing. Uh, but you do talk about human the humanity self-exclusion from the world, uh, a, a we that is sort of uh, equated with this figure of humanity. Um, I would sort of try to to um, provoke you in a way to think with me uh, around the idea of uh, the effective labor of recognizing the disparity between uh, our different positions, um, specifically those going through the kind of long term or the long durée of uh, Western nihilism, um, and think about how differential inheritances produce also differential responsibilities. Is this something that you would agree with? Yes, th this is a very interesting and complex question, of course. Uh, one of the uh, performative gestures of dumb philosophy was to write a philosophy not only about the dumb, but also from the standpoint of the dumb. So it's a philosophy of the dumb in these two senses. And of course, uh, uh, in, in this endeavor, the risk or the danger is precisely a homogenization where things are heterogeneous, where there are differences, there is a kind of covering over of differences, precisely because this is the dynamic of the dump. In the dump, all differences melt away and evaporate, right? Um, and, and yes, so the, there is a danger, uh, as you say, of overlooking differential responsibilities uh, uh, and, and, and different uh, modes and different degrees of victimization, one would say, right, by the dynamics of the dump. At the same time, I thought that this strategy was uh, justifiable because um, e even though the situation is not as homogeneous nowadays in terms of, let's say, the uh, effects, the, the felt experienced effects of the dump, uh, we can project uh, ourselves a little bit into the not so distant future and see how the, what, what are now the worst pockets of pollution would become more generalized and more like the rule than the exception 
that they still might be today. Uh, and so I was guided, even though I do not mention it in the book, I was guided by uh, a, a kind of thesis from Herbert Marcuse that only the exaggeration is true. So yes, there is a hyperbolic element to dumb philosophy. It is an exaggerated vision of the world or the unworld that we're living in, but it is an exaggeration that is justified by the tendency a uh, historical tendency in which the world as a whole is moving toward a general unlivability as opposed to the uh, more intense unlivability in certain parts of the world today. Uh, so this is one, one of the points. The other is that of course, uh, and, and I, I touch upon this particularly in dumb philosophy, uh, that of course those who are more privileged or more wealthy uh, uh, can try to look for uh, uh, the most minimized uh, situations where, where the effects of the dump are, are minimized. Uh, and, and one can try to find uh, refuge in gourmet dining, for instance, or the super rich who have their uh, doomsday bunkers in uh, New Zealand, right, who just separate themselves from what is the rest of uh, the doomed uh, uh, reality of the, the rest of the world. But uh, all of these, uh, I claim, are false solutions because when the very form of experience has been eviscerated, when the very possibility of experiencing the world and of living and of being in the world has been undercut, it is impossible to find exceptional places where experience would still be uh, accessible or possible given the destruction of the concrete form of experience as such. Uh, and that is why in relation to the we, which I take as a very uh, a, a genuine problem, a political problem to be solved, not once and for all, but to keep solving as we move along, this we uh, that uh, emerges in the book, that is born out of the dump in the book, is what I call in a shorthand, the dumped dumpers. So even who are, those who are the dumpers, the Western uh, uh, upper class humanity, as it were, those who uh, say that they are speaking for the rest of humanity uh, and, and who uh, um, are, are in one way or another uh, complicit with uh, the industrial and post-industrial devastation that is going on, these dumpers are themselves the dump dumpers. So there is no way to have an active position of dumping without suffering the effects of the dump, right? This is the idea. And uh, I think that a we that is less differentiated, but nonetheless more uh, 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 general and even universal in a new sense could emerge from this uh, idea of the dump dumpers. A we that is not only human, a we that is not only human, but that includes solidarity with uh, non-human forms of life like animals and plants who are industrially produced for the sake of being consumed and destroyed, for instance. And uh, really the, the, the task is to, uh, uh, to take this position of, of the dump dumpers and, and uh, to, to try to let this new solidarity to uh, emerge from, from it. And that solidarity is also a kind of rewriting of knowledge in a way. Um, and uh, maybe to jump to this, to, to our specific roles uh, in, in, in the dump, uh, there's a point, a point in the book where you write that all forms of knowledge are no longer adequate and, um, or at least to, to understand the, how ecological realities are changing at a faster pace and the frameworks made for grasping them. Um, I personally think that one of the greatest achievements in the book is how it, present, it presents masses of data, emissions, uh, non-decomposable products uh, as epitomes of um, some of the greatest Western philosophers, Plato, Plato's ideas, Aristotle's unmoved mover, Augustine's God, Linnaeus' taxonomy, Spinoza's substance, Descartes' split subject, uh, and of course, Kant thing in, it, in itself. Uh, but it also doesn't necessarily turn to past systems of knowledge uh, at face value from ancient Greece to Rome to Chinese traditions to agnosticism. The other day we were talking about the Indian Vedas. Um, so you're proposing something else altogether. Uh, and let me be a bit more specific maybe for our viewers here, um, which is 
in the book, Michael is writing about how our corporeal psychic interior, interiority is equally to toxic. Uh, you talk about a, a triad, polluted sensorium, venomous Im imagination, and violent intellection. Uh, the latter of which is made of toxic thoughts, uh, of uh, toxic desires, and toxic modes of reasoning. So I was wondering here if um, we could talk a little bit about what happens uh, when that toxicity sort of breaks away the metaphysical divide of the inner and the outer. And in that circumstance, what uh, forms of knowledge, uh, what ways of knowing and forms of knowledge making practices do we need for this 21st century? Uh, yes, definitely, Sophia. And let me try to parse your question out in, in, into at least two uh, parts. The first one about metaphysics. Uh, the idea is that metaphysics is not just ideas. It is not those uh, old dust gathering texts uh, by Plato and Aristotle, but also uh, certain texts in the Chinese Indian traditions where uh, the ideal is eternal being, right? Uh, if we were to gather metaphysics in the, uh, an overall, under an overall heading, under an overall umbrella, which is very uh, transcultural or cross-cultural, believe me, then uh, metaphysical being would be precisely this uh, eternal being which does not undergo any changes, which does not perish, which is not generated, which does not decay. And uh, if this is the way in which we describe metaphysical being, then we can very easily see how uh, it has been instantiated, that is concretely produced today, uh, in things like plastics that take uh, hundreds of years to decompose, and otherwise they just break down into smaller and smaller parts. In a nuclear waste, the, the waste that remains after uh, uh, the production of atomic energy uh, that takes uh, uh, thousands of years to, uh, uh, to decompose and to degrade as well. Uh, so my idea is that uh, th this dream, this kind of deranged dream of metaphysics, of uh, eternal being, has been realized here on Earth, and its realization has shown what an absolute nightmare it is in environmental terms, precisely because once we have here on Earth something that is uh, close to an eternally unchangeable being, obviously, 500 years is not an eternity, nor uh, 20,000 years or 100,000 years that it takes certain uh, nuclear materials to degrade. But from the standpoint of a human lifespan or of even of the lifespan of a human species compared to the half-lives of certain atomic elements, uh, this is very close to eternity. Uh, and so once the dimension of decay, decomposition, uh, and so on is undercut once it's eviscerated and uh, uh, eliminated, nearly eliminated from our world, uh, uh, an absolute nightmare ensues in environmental terms. And this was the idea uh, to, to show how metaphysics is not just discourses, it's not just words, it's not just texts, it's embedded and embodied in concrete practices and things that surround us and that make at this, at this very moment make the world unlivable. Right. This is one large point of, uh, I think, that addresses your question. The other one has to do with toxicity, and there is a chapter dedicated to toxicity in dumb philosophy. Uh, and what I do is I compare toxic substances to poisons, because if you think about a poisonous snake or a poisonous spider, uh, what it does is it... Um, directs its venom toward a certain threatening other. So if you are stung by a snake or by a spider, you are obviously, it can be lethal. You can even die from, from the bite. But uh, the, in, in attacking you, this uh, uh, animal singularizes you as a target. You become singularized by, by being targeted. You are the one targeted, not anyone else in this particular instance. With toxicity, Things do not work this way because toxic, toxic substances are so dispersed and um, uh, so uh, amorphously present that they do not target anything or anyone. They affect everything that is in their path, right? Regardless of 
species boundaries, regardless of kingdoms boundaries. So uh, a substance that is toxic for plants is likely going to be toxic for uh, your dog who goes and uh, uh, runs on the, uh, on the grass and it's going to be toxic to your child as well. So uh, you see that there is no, it's an undifferentiated kind of harmfulness that I associate much more with a dump than the more singularized targeting uh, by poison. And I think that toxicity in this sense, of course, uh, in recent years, the expression toxic masculinity has become uh, also uh, very prevalent. Uh, toxicity has to be understood in this sense that uh, it, it, whether it's a toxic substance that is physical or ideation such as toxic masculinity, it does not target this or that particular person or even group, but rather its effects are harmful in a dispersed way that targets everyone and everything in, in the path. So that toxic masculinity is toxic, not only for women, but also for men, for transgendered people and, and so on and so forth, right? Just as a toxic substance is, is toxic for plants, animals, humans, uh, even bacteria. Yeah. So the third part of the question then was, um, what kinds of knowledge making practices do we need to address um, do we need to address the, the challenges of our commons futures? Uh, yes, so uh, looking, looking out into the future, uh, the, the question would be how do we reconstruct uh, not only our epistemologies, not only our knowledge making practices, but even our sensorium, the way we sense and experience the world. Right, because uh, if you think about phenomenological consciousness, and after all, it's a book that at least purportedly is about phenomenology. In phenomenology, starting with Husserl, consciousness is a directedness toward. So consciousness is precisely this venomous animal <laughs> that uh, shoots its poison toward a certain target and singularizes it in that way. So when I'm conscious of the screen in front of me, my consciousness is singularized by that toward which it's directed including not only the representation of it, but my gaze uh, is directed toward the screen and so on and so forth. There is a kind of mutual singularization of the targeting and the targeted. If, as I'm claiming in the age of the dump, this kind of singularization no longer works, the model of the poison is substituted at the, at the ontological, at the general level by the model of toxicity, then consciousness itself becomes dispersed like the uh, uh, like the boy, like the toxic substance, uh, and um, it is no longer possible to just focus on one particular thing or target or being, uh, and that's why we get distraction as the most prevalent mode of attention <laughs> as well. And the same applies uh, to our senses, not only to uh, the more abstract notion of consciousness, so that we cannot seek purity. Uh, in our sensorium, in our sense of vision or hearing or taste or even touch. There is no pure terrain unaffected by the dump there or anywhere else, in fact. Uh, so that, uh, as I claim in the chapter on the senses, our senses are uh, like garbage receptacles for the, the excessive stimuli that hit them and the excessive stimuli that are generally uh, very homogenous once again, very bright lights, like in light pollution. The idea is that you cannot see the subtler uh, light of the stars in a city where everything is flooded by, by light, right? So um, uh, our senses are affected and deformed and deshaped uh, also by, uh, by these very uh, events. So. Uh, what I have tried to do in dumb philosophy is outline areas of concern and give some clues as to the directions in which we can move. But uh, the next step would be to think about what, what remains, what do we have left uh, in order to start thinking again and to start feeling and, and sensing again in the age of the dump. And my general response is that we cannot think or feel or experience outside of the dump, we have to learn to do so within, both with and against the dump in this tense position of being with and against at the same time. So sure, that brings us beautifully to the role of art. Um, I'm, I'm aware of time and we're about to open uh, to questions from the floor. 
um, but before before that, and please do feel free to sort of start um, thinking about your questions and what you would like to um, ask Michael. Um, I want to to share with our viewers that uh, the book on philosophy is richly illustrated with photographs of pollutants uh, that have been taken by your long term collaborator, the French artist uh, Anaïs Tondeur. Um, also, the two of us, we met through a collaboration with an artist, Thomas Saraceno, uh, with whom you have a new book coming out. And another one of your upcoming books also features a different collaboration, not with a visual artist, but with a musician who sonifies the ecological theology of uh, St. Hildegard de Bingen, uh, the 12th century German Benedict uh, polymath. And uh, considering this question about uh, sensing, thinking, feeling, knowing, from, with, from within and against the dump. Um, could you tell us how you, became, how you began working together with artists and what benefits do you see in the exchange between the arts and philosophy? Yes, well, this question is very general, but in order to do justice to uh, collaboration with, to my collaborations with artists, I, I can probably um, address them only at a very singular level as well, uh, talking about specific projects. Um, uh, so in the case of dumb philosophy, I did continue my collaboration with uh, Anne Stender, uh, and the idea was to um, to show that my own thinking about the dump was not separate from the uh, very physical of effects of the dump on me, uh, on my body and on my mind, and that uh, the art uh, that can be made in the age of the dump is also not this kind of uh, safe and neutral and innocent position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the dump itself. Uh, so the process that um, Anais and I went through was uh, that while I was working, writing portions of the book, I was wearing uh, carbon uh, capturing masks that captured carbon particles from the air in the room where I was uh, writing uh, the text. And Anais uh, um, actually documented a part of the process and then received the filters that were filled with uh, the pollution captured from the air as I was breathing uh, in and, and writing. Uh, and what Anais did was uh, with her fellow, uh, her collaborators who are scientists, she uh, distilled those particles from, uh, extracted them from the mask uh, and distilled um, uh, a new kind of ink out of them that included the very physical pollution that surrounded me at the time of uh, uh, writing the book. Uh, and she printed the photographs of the sky made above my office uh, in part with the ink made of this of these pollutants. So you can see one of these photographs is behind me, but many of them are also in the book. This one in its materiality includes the very pollution that was uh, uh, in the air at the time. Um, and, and so here the idea was to uh, show a total character of the dump that uh, uh, swallows and envelops and englobes the thinker and the artist and thinking and the arts uh, besides the actual themes uh, that are, are discussed in the book. Uh, now, in relation to other co collaborations, the uh, stories and the narratives are very singular, as I mentioned, and very attuned to the subject matter itself. But the only general thing I could say in this regard is that uh, I try to uh, uh, to give readers who are also viewers and listeners in this sense um, uh, as much of an ambient experience of uh, thinking uh, uh, as possible, because I do believe that thinking is not an abstract kind of ideational process, or it's not only that. It involves our uh, aesthetic experience, meaning not only artistic experience, but uh, what our senses perceive, for instance. Uh, and in order to have uh, several layers or levels of thinking, it is necessary to include that aesthetic experience in the two senses of aesthetic, both artistic and sensory. Uh, and that is why the visual dimension is very present in many of these collaborations. And I'm very happy, as you mentioned, Sophia, that uh, the, uh, the auditory dimension, the, the listening or the hearing is also going to be engaged in relation to a work on uh, on and with 
Hildegard of Bingen, uh, who herself uh, wrote uh, incredible musical compositions. And that was a, a homage both from me and from the composer, the Swedish composer Peter Schubach, uh, to her own musical practice. I wish we had time to go into more detail about Ilhegard and about all of the, the body of work that you've written around vegetality. Uh, I feel very confident to say that you're perhaps the greatest uh, phytophilosopher of our times. Um, but since I'm aware of time and there's already so many interesting questions in the Q&A, um, I'd like to relate one of the questions to, uh, to that aesthetic dimension that you were alluding to this all-encompassing sort of uh, uh, experience uh, of, of reading, non-representational experience of, of reading and thinking with you. Um, and it's a question from Cinderella Sakaida, um, to who's wondering uh, if you could tell us something about your literary style of writing, um, and in particularly in, in dumb philosophy. I would add to this question also, uh, one of the new elements that you introduce in this book, uh, which are the elemental lam lam laments at the end of the book in poetic verse. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about both, both the writing style in this book and the choice for the poetry uh, at the end of the book. Uh, yes, thank you very much both uh, to Cinderella Sikaida and, and uh, Sofia for following up on this question. Um, of, of the literary or, or the writing style itself, uh, I would say that the materiality of the word is very important for me. And uh, in relation to, to the dump, uh, I make it very clear from the very beginning of the book that the word dump is, uh, uh, is crucial for me, not only because it is both a noun and a verb, so it is both an action and the outcome of that action of, of dumping, but also because of the materiality of the word dump that uh, does what it says. It is dumped on our ears. So there's the explosive or plosive sound, d, uh, followed by p at the end. Uh, and if you look at the etymology of the, of the word, it comes from the Old Norse dumpe, uh, which means to, to plop or to, to fall with this enormous force. So the word itself produces the effect that it's that it names, which is this dropping with a with a kind of explosive uh, force. And for me, th this is very important. Words are not just words ever, uh, because they have had uh, um, centuries and millennia of uh, shaping and input uh, and, and usage. And so it's not completely arbitrary that it is this word and not not another. And this applies to um, all of my works, I would say, not only to dumb philosophy. Uh, but uh, in addition to this, yes, indeed, there is uh, what I call a poetic appendix at the end of the book, which is a small cycle of five poems uh, titled Elemental Laments. Uh, and in this cycle, uh, more so than uh, relating or expressing particular ideas, I want to give uh, uh, readers a certain sense of the rhythm or the pace of the dump because uh, the laments or the poems uh, follow a particular, uh, a particular kind of rhythmic uh, arrangement. So maybe just to, to give a very quick example, I will read two of those uh, uh, five poems, two very short ones. So th there are five of them, uh, four for each of the elements and one for the elements themselves. And the ones that I will be reading are the earth and the air. So the earth. Underlying, drying, flying in the air, dust, supporting, dwarfing the deporting authorities and us, nourishing plants and receiving the perishing, cracked by tremors, fracked by greed, furrowed by agriculture, burrowed by the mole and the worm, cork tree and birch roots and weeds, granting an afterlife to compost, thwarting the pretense of stability, storing natural gas, fossils, old lithium batteries, depleted uranium, bronze coins, and everything else it conceals in its bowels for the time being. And then air, enveloping, developing weather fronts, hosting birds, insects, and jumbo jets, proving indispensable for breathing, 
easing the, the force of gravity in proportion to being rarefied, teasing with invisibility, lending itself to sight under a veil of smog, suffocating, deflating our ideologies of unlimited industrial progress, tending to heat up in the age of global roasting, boasting quality indices and standards, spirited away, expired. So this, uh, this rhythm for me, at least in the cycle, is more important than the actual, as it were, content of, of the poems themselves. This is what I wanted to draw uh, attention to here. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and I'll jump to one of the questions that is um, on the Q&A. And it's a question from uh, Joanna Siafone. I hope I'm not mispronouncing. Um, and uh, Joanna says, uh, purity may no longer be an option in the age of the dump, but is there anything Michael feels can be done with the idea of purity? Does it serve to you, Michael, as an ideal, even if not an achievable one? Thank you for the conversation. You're on mute, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this question. Um, I would say that purity as an ideal is a very dangerous one, uh, in fact, because it is uh, usually in the name of purity that the most polluting kind of activities are undertaken. And there are different levels at which purity can be dangerous. Uh, one level is that, um, Purity is really the metaphysical ideal. So you could sense that there is uh, something that is pure and uh, inviolable that cannot be contaminated regardless of anything that happens in physical reality. So this can be a powerful and horrible justification for all kinds of violence. You could say, uh, I, I can do whatever, whatever to this person or to this being, but there, uh, uh, their purity, their, their kind of inviolability will not be touched by whatever violence I unleash against them. And this is, in fact, I'm not making it up because this is an argument made by Immanuel Levinas, the ethical philosopher, uh, as, as we know from the 20th century, because for him, the face of the other is the site of purity that cannot be violated. And he says it very clearly. This is the most metaphysical moment, I would say, in all of Levinas. He says, no matter what I do to, to the other, I can uh, rape or kill or violate the other in whatever way. The face of the other is untouchable. It cannot be violated. So it's this ideal of purity that, uh, okay, but what, what happens to this person who has been raped or killed or violated in other, in other ways? It's not a big consolation that the face of the other has been untouched and left in its purity uh, despite all of these activities. So to me, this is a very dangerous terrain and even such an astute thinker as, as Levinas has fallen into the trap of purity. And the other danger of purity as an ideal is precisely uh, uh, at the level not only of ideals, but of ideas. So as I said at the beginning of our conversation, uh, our idea of water includes the ideal of purity, but uh, what this actual liquid substance is that we, we drink either from the tap or from a water bottle uh, is very different from that idea which is shaped by the ideal. So again, this gap between the actual reality and the idea slash ideal uh, is, is a dangerous uh, uh, thing because we can overlook and neglect and ignore all kinds of uh, uh, contaminations and very dangerous ones at that uh, in the name of the idea or ideal of purity. So these are just two examples as to uh, um, how I, I would think that the ideal of purity is a dangerous one, in fact. And, and I guess it, it very much participates in the sort of uh, narrative time of progress as well, um, by which uh, we've, we've gotten here, whether we're talking about revolutionary brilliance, spiritual enlightenment, or Western modernity in general. Um, but that relates very well to Tonya Stevens' question. Um, and Tonya asks, uh, is there any mileage to explore the dumping as a misguided gift, as well as a nihilism that needs to be embraced and moved through? 
Yes, I, I, I think a very brief answer is that, that yes, there is a lot of mileage to, to this idea because uh, uh, dumping is really uh, a misguided gift. Uh, if, if you know the logic of uh, um, uh, excrementality in psychoanalysis and Freud, and if you looked at uh, the chapter on, uh, on dumping and the excremental logic in dump philosophy, you know that um, the dumping, uh, that the, 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 uh, the feces, the way the child relates to it is first uh, as, as, as a gift, and then as, uh, as a child that one uh, uh, delivers into the world. Uh, and so my idea in dump philosophy was that uh, humanity itself, the dumping humanity, whoever the groups identified under that heading are, um, are in the position of uh, Freudian children. Freudian children who are relating effectively uh, to, to, to this gift. And that is why, in fact, I think the Anthropocene, or what we call the Anthropocene, uh, involves so many contradictory effective reactions. So it's a site at the same time of repulsion. Oh, this is what we have done to the planet, right? And at the same time of admiration and even awe and wonder Oh, we have done that, right? So just as a child who looks at, uh, at her, his feces in, in, the, uh, in the toilet and, and sort of has a sense of achievement about this creation, right? This is what, what happens at the level of the Anthropocene and the kind of planet shaping pollution that has been produced. Uh, so it, yes, it is definitely a misguided uh, gift, a gift that uh, uh, is unconsciously given and then uh, indeed, if we follow through the logic of psychoanalysis, an unconscious gift has to be worked through consciously. So we have to uh, rewind and repeat the movement, but already with conscious recognition. And my wager in dumb philosophy was that this book is a modest contribution to this rewinding and repetition of the unconscious gift. And that perhaps relate to Don Utter's question. Can one be human in the dump? Well, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting question because, uh, because maybe, just maybe the human, uh, what, what, what we call the human is uh, a dumper, <laughs> this being who, who dumps. And that is why uh, uh, the um, ge geological age that we live in has been called the Anthropocene from Anthropos, the, the human for, uh, the, 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 the Greek for human. Uh, but of course, it's a very ironic kind of reading of the Anthropocene, right? If the earth has been created or produced as this uh, 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 collection of excrements, of techno excrements, then uh, it is a very strange development in which we are looking at a mirror that the earth has become, at this geological mirror made of uh, shit, literally. And we recognize ourselves in it. And we say, yes, this is what the human is. This is why we're calling it the Anthropocene because the planet shaped in this way is what has been created by this being called Anthropos, human. It becomes a kind of retroactive self-definition of the human as a species that has been able to do this to the planet. Of course, there are many other species and kinds of beings that have had a planet scale effect uh, from, from the first uh, uh, bacteria that created uh, oxygen, uh, uh, for instance, to plants themselves that have uh, created a, a livable world for, for other, uh, or other organic beings, other, other living beings. Uh, so in a sense, it is both, just to give a very short response perhaps, it is both a humanizing and a dehumanizing gesture to recognize oneself in the dump. Right, is to humanize oneself and in the same move to dehumanize and not to be human. Uh, Michael, there's, there's a couple of outstanding questions, but I'm aware that um, we only have three minutes left and I wouldn't want to leave the audience without um, a broader uh, understanding of your work. So first of all, please do go out 
get yourself a copy of Dumb Philosophy. Um, but do look through Michael's website. There's a number of books, of projects, of papers that are, wide, that are readily available online. Um, and uh, Michael, I would like to invite you to talk, to tell us about the different tra intersecting trajectories in your work. So on the one hand, uh, you've explored in depth the idea of plant thinking and being, vegetality, uh, which we only sort of mentioned in brief throughout the conversation, but another strand of your work deals with uh, energy, dust and decay. Um, and it seems that these two create a delicate balance between, or perhaps generative friction uh, between decay and regeneration, hopefulness and nihilism. Uh, would you agree with this statement and where would them philosophy fit within these trajectories? Yes, definitely, Sophia. I, I would say that um, uh, dumb philosophy is the other pole of vegetal thinking or plant thinking uh, in the sense in which in the dump, the very connection between growth and decay has been undone. And this is what allows the dump to accrete, to grow by accretion, because uh, it is an accumulation of things that do not decay, that do not decompose, that do not open the space and the time for future growth. And plants do the exact opposite of this, right? Plants are the very living bonds between growth and decay. There is no vegetal growth without decay, and there is no decay without vegetal growth. So this is, this is the polar opposition between the two themes. But on the other hand, and I only touch upon this in dump philosophy, the most uncanny effect of the dump, uh, at least to my mind, is that it starts approximating what the Greeks called physis and what in Latin became natura or nature, right? So this very overall growth of everything that is uh, under the heading of the dump uh, starts mimicking and imitating nature and physis and uh, vegetality itself, but without the essential dimension of decay, right? So, um, uh, so to my mind, there is uh, also a certain convergence, a very uh, uh, again, depressing convergence here, we go back to the same word and, and affect, a depressing convergence at the level of growth, uh, in one case by accretion, in another case by mutual feeding of growth and decay. And I would only add to this, since we're running out of time, that um, uh, the book on uh, St. Hildegard, Green Mass, uh, was written in a way to, to try to cure myself and, and maybe others, if uh, others care to join me in this uh, adventure, uh, to, to cure myself and maybe others of this nihilistic, uh, uh, depressing uh, effects. Uh, so I think that Hildegard has a lot to tell us about how to live otherwise than by dumping and being dumped, even in an age as depressing as ours.